Good morning. Thanks for joining us for the early service. Hope you're doing well today. Thanks for uh, being here in the Lord's house. I want to start by reading just a verse or two uh, from the book of Psalms this morning. Uh, let's turn to Psalm 133. Psalm 133. And uh, look at just the verse here. And then we'll get into our, our worship and singing today. Almost feels like we could see some snow coming down out there this morning, the way it's overcast. I know that's a, that's a no-no word, isn't it? But it uh, kind of has that feel out there and uh, pushing through November now. And I hope that uh, you had a great week. We had a good day yesterday. Addison turned 12, so we got to celebrate her birthday. Jackson has first basketball game. We lost by a point, so that wasn't so good. But, you know, sometimes you learn, uh, I think, more from losing than winning. And uh, he had had a couple, couple winning seasons, and then we lost our first game yesterday. But uh, anyways, uh, good, good times uh, at our house over the weekend. But Psalm 133, uh, let me just read this, uh, these three verses to you from this chapter and uh, make a couple comments, then we'll pray. Uh, Psalm 133, and verse 1 says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, and went down to the skirts of his garments, as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. I was reminded about the importance of unity from verse. One, and it says how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. So I'm, I'm thankful that we can dwell together today, that we can meet together. We need church so desperately, don't we? Uh, just the fellowship and the encouragement. And so I'm glad we can be together today, praying that God will unify us by his spirit. It's a precious thing when believers are unified. And we know that the enemy seeks to divide us so he can conquer us. So we've got to stay unified, stay together, not only physically, but spiritually be connected uh, through the Lord. And so I think that's going to be important today. Let's pray God will give us that sweet unity here in these services. Let's pray and ask, ask God to be with us today as we worship him. Father, thank you for your word. I'm grateful for the book of Psalms and the encouragement as we listen to the words of David. What a great man of God he was. Thankful for his honesty and transparency. And Lord, just as much as he needed you, we need you today. I pray you'd meet with us. I pray, Lord, that you would bless this gathering of believers. Thank you for the local church, the called out assembly. Thank you, Lord, that we can meet uh, in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ today. We ask, Lord, that you give us sweet unity by the Spirit of God. We pray for those that cannot be here today. I know that we're missing several of our main members today because of sickness. And, Lord, we ask that you would touch them and help them. I pray that they would feel a part of what's happening here even this morning. Thank you for the live stream option. And we ask, Lord, that you would touch this service as only you can as we seek to worship you and praise you and exalt your name. Uh, Lord, I ask that you would... Be right here with us. Be in the midst. Encourage us. Lord, convict us where needed. Guide us today by your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for praying this morning. Let's take our hymnals if you need uh, the notes. But let's stand together. And we're going to start on 170. Uh, I apologize. You're going to hear a lot of my voice today. Uh, I'm, I'm what you call the backup, backup song leader. So uh, that, that's me this morning. Uh, Ron cannot be here as well as Brian and uh, Valerie and their family are out of town. So uh, I'm the backup, backup. You're stuck with me. But 170 is a great song, Saved by the Blood. Let's sing all four verses this morning. Saved by the blood of the crucified one, now ransomed from sin and a new work begun. Sing praise to the Father and praise to the Son. Saved by the blood of the crucified one, saved, saved. My sins are all pardoned, my guilt is all gone. Saved, saved, I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. 
the angels rejoicing because it is done a child of the father joined heir with the son saved by the blood of the crucified one saved saved my sins are all pardoned my guilt is all gone saved saved i'm saved by the blood of the and one saved by the blood of the crucified one the father he spake and his will it was done great price of my pardon his own precious son saved by the blood of the crucified one saved saved my sins are all pardoned my guilt is all gone saved saved I'm saved by the blood of the crucified crucified one saved by the blood of the crucified one all hail to the father all hail to the son all hail to the spirit the great three and one saved by the blood of the crucified one saved saved my sins are all pardoned my guilt is all gone saved saved i'm saved by the blood of the crucified one thank you, you may be seated and let me give you a few announcements that song was up there. That was right at, how many of that was kind of like right at the limit of your range? How many of that was beyond your range? Yeah. Wow. That's a great song, isn't it? All right. Let me give you these announcements here quickly and uh, just remind you what's happening weekly and then some future dates and events here that we want to highlight. Nursery provided next service and tonight. Tithes and offerings can be left in the back or given online. Sunday night, Sunday school tonight at 5 o'clock. And adults, I want to invite you to look ahead at Acts 15 and verse 28 if you get a chance. And uh, we'll be studying uh, what I'm entitling necessary things. And uh, I think it will be help to us about biblical priorities, time management, uh, how we decipher between what is necessary and unnecessary. And uh, I think there will be some very practical things tonight in that study this evening at 5. Tuesday, Truth. Uh, and then Wednesday night in the book of Exodus, we'll be in Exodus 16, uh, second part, uh, verse 14 to 36, and we'll be studying the manna. And uh, that's a, a great study on uh, what manna represents, the symbolism of manna and how God provided for his people and how God will provide for you. And so I know you'll be uh, blessed by the study Wednesday night. This Friday from 6 to 9, uh, teen game night. And that'll be at the Van Kirks from 6 to 9. And uh, looking forward to that youth activity. Ladies Bible study is this Saturday at 1.30 here at the church. All ladies and teen girls are welcome to come for that time of prayer and Bible study. And then, uh, not this week, but next Tuesday, November the 24th at 7 p.m., we will bump our midweek service from Wednesday to Tuesday with the holiday and have a special service of praise, which is one of our highlights. We love this service and are looking forward to uh, giving those praises. So come prepared to share and uh, just give some testimony to God's goodness in your life uh, this year. These will be unique praises because uh, there's been a lot of changes this year, but lots of praises and blessings as well. And so looking forward to that and uh, also bring a dessert to share uh, on that evening and we'll have some good fellowship afterward. Building fund offering uh, with the fifth Sunday 
uh, this month we'll have a building fund offering, and uh, that'll be all of the offering outside of missions money, money on uh, the 29th uh, will be given to that. And then uh, Christmas party, uh, the first Friday in December, we're planning uh, to have a Christmas party, church-wide Christmas party, so all kids, teens, adults are welcome to join us for that. And if we can, if we can get it uh, set up, we're going to send out a sign-up sheet uh, to you that you can sign up on uh, through Flocknote, and hopefully it'll be an easy way to sign up for that and kind of give us an idea of who's coming and how we can plan for that. But that's always a, a great time. Uh, we'll do some fun games, and uh, just looking forward to the Christmas party this year. And then uh, let me just give um, uh, other other announcements here, just a, a quick presentation on some of the uh, families that uh, we prayed through, and then now we're supporting um, our missions pledge went up. So we praise God for that, and we appreciate uh, your uh, steps of faith after our conference. Um, our pledge went up quite a bit. So we voted in our last business meeting to take on six new families, uh, which is a step of faith for us, uh, but we believe God's going to provide. And we've had some great families come through. So these families come, kind of the process is they come, they present their family, and their ministry to our church so we can kind of get a heart and a feel for what God's doing. And then uh, we pray about not just supporting them through prayer, but also through finances. And so these families, uh, we're going to be sending money to them each month to help them with their ministry. Some of them are still on deputation, raising funds. Some now are on the field, uh, but we're glad we can partner with them and really expand the influence of our church we can't go to all these places, but we can give and support. And so here's the families. This is the King family, and maybe some of you remember them. They came on a Sunday night, and they're headed to Mexico, and uh, God's really bringing in their support quickly. They're in Alaska right now. Uh, I think their support level is like in uh, 80, mid-80s uh, at this point, and so we're glad we can partner with them. Um, if you can advance those. Stover family. Uh, they are veteran missionaries, but they're raising some additional support. They just got back to Peru, and uh, so we're excited to partner with them and uh, their family. We have the Murdochs headed to Germany. They're still on deputation, but again, uh, God's really uh, blessing them. And then we also have the Whipler family to Finland that we'll be supporting. And we have the Staley's, uh, and their head, I believe they're, they're planning to minister in the country of Spain is where God's directing them and just to minister to military overseas. And a great family has been uh, in missions for a long time. And then uh, finally, and this is kind of something different, not a missionary family, but a ministry, Jehovah Jireh Ministries. And you probably heard us talk about them before. Uh, there's a plaque in our lobby uh, with their name on it, and they helped us here. And so we really want to give back and uh, help them as they're helping other churches get their first building. They specialize in helping independent Baptists purchase and renovate their first building. So you can see how uh, important that ministry is. So we'll be giving to that ministry and helping with that as well. So just wanted to let you know that. It's good news. want to thank you for your steps of faith and giving and faith promise and let you know uh, where that's going. I think that takes our total up now uh, to 23 different families that we're supporting. And so that, that's exciting. All right, let's, uh, let's sing again. And let's turn to 187, 187, and I think that we have four verses on this, if I remember correctly, so we'll kind of see as it's going through, uh, but 187, Amazing Grace, there's six verses listed in the uh, hymnal here, but we'll just sing four of those, or I guess we'll sing whatever comes on the screen, so just be watching the screen there, and I'll try to watch too, um, but let's stand together and sing Amazing Grace, and let's really sing it from our hearts to the Lord this morning. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my own 
to fear and grace my fears relieve how precious did that grace appear the hour I first through many dangers toils and snares I have already come tis grace has brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me on when we've been there ten thousand years bright shining as the sun we've no less days to sing god's praise than when we first begun. And I lied. There were only three verses. He can be seated. Wasn't that three? Did I miscount? No, well, that was four. I see, I can't count. Whatever. Anyways, they're all good, right? Gabby's going to play for us this morning. I uh, appreciate her being willing to uh, step into the special music and play for the Lord today. And uh, let's have our Bibles out. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. And we'll be looking at several verses this morning. And I'm going to draw your attention to the question you see there on the screen, who then can be saved? And uh, we'll look at that here in just a moment. Uh, but first, Gabby's going to play for us. Thank you so much. Gabby, let's look here in Luke chapter 18, and I want to direct your attention to verse 26, Luke 18 and verse number 26. Now, I plan uh, in the time that we have to look at the rest of this chapter. We started the chapter last week, 
Uh, we looked at the first part of chapter 18, uh, but I want us to look at the, the rest of the chapter. But let's just start here in verse 26 and notice a question that is asked of Jesus by his disciples. And I think this is a really important question for us to consider uh, here even this morning as we think about uh, salvation and the, the songs have been centered around salvation, amazing grace, and save, save. Uh, but look here at this question in verse 26. And as I was reading and praying through the passage, God just kept bringing me back to this question. So I've chosen uh, the question as the title of the sermon this morning. But let's look at it in verse 26. And this is after the rich young ruler came to Jesus and unfortunately, he walked away. He chose his riches over a personal relationship with Jesus. And then uh, Jesus said some very strong statements about the difficulty of rich people being saved. Uh, and the disciples, then in verse 26, they said this, And they that heard it said, Who then can be saved? Who then can be saved? Now the word saved there, I think that we are pretty familiar with. Uh, the world doesn't quite understand the word saved. Uh, they often think that it refers to some type of financial salvation or maybe some kind of physical salvation. But we know it's a spiritual word here. It means to deliver or to rescue. For me, I got saved at 17. I'm not sure when you got saved, how old you were. Some have been saved for many, many years. But we all need to have a, a personal salvation uh, that's centered on the Lord Jesus Christ, that's, that's through grace, by faith. And these disciples here, they asked that question, who then can be saved? They had an understanding about what it meant to be saved, but what they're asking is, uh, who qualifies for salvation? Who can be saved? Uh, some of the greatest theologians in the world have wrestled with this simple little question, who can be saved? I think there's really two answers to this question. Uh, we could say that a select few can be saved. Or we could also say that whosoever will can be saved. Now, I've had a lot of discussions about this topic. I've taught some lessons on it as it's come up in Scripture. Uh, I have a, a good friend of mine uh, that began to go down the path of what we would call Calvinism. And Calvinism, really, if you study that, it's a theological belief or system founded by John Calvin and his followers, his successors, that really overemphasizes, I believe, and even distorts the Bible doctrine of predestination. That, that's a biblical word, but people have really twisted that and distorted that to mean something that's outside of Scripture. And so as a result of those conversations I would have with this individual and some of my personal study, I began to develop a list of verses just as I came to them in Scripture, my own personal reading, uh, Scriptures that pointed to a whosoever type salvation. And it was amazing to me. I was just looking at some of the verses this past week, and at this point I have 50 plus verses that I just read personally that talk about the fact that salvation is for all. I want to just point you to one, and then I'm coming back here. This is not really a topical study. This is an expository study. But I do want to point you to one verse. There's so many places we could go, and we think about who can be saved. Uh, turn to Romans, please. Romans chapter 3. This is one of my favorite ones. Romans chapter 3, and I want us to look at verse 22. And I think you know this if you studied the doctrine of Scripture and you've studied the doctrine of our church, which we hope lines up closely, very closely with Scripture, the uh, doctrinal statement of Lifeway Baptist Church, uh, we pass that out to prospective members and different ones that are interested. We have it listed on our website. Uh, it's really just the, the doctrine of the Bible, of the New Testament. And uh, as we've studied that, we've made a clear stand uh, that we do believe that all people can be saved. We believe that Jesus died for every person, one of my favorite verses from the book of Hebrews says that Jesus tasted death for every man. And so we believe that every means all. Romans 3, and I look at verse 22. The Bible says this, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Now, let me just point out something in this verse here. 
and, and show you why this is one of my favorite whosoever will verses in Scripture. It says here that this righteousness of God, it comes by faith. Okay, it's, it's not a result of works, but it says it's unto all. But then it says this, and upon all them that believe. I think one of the best ways we could say this is salvation to be delivered, to be rescued, to be saved. Salvation is universally offered. The verse says there it's unto all, but it has to be individually accepted. It says it's unto all, but it's only upon all them that believe. God in his foreknowledge, and that's another Bible term, he knows who will be saved. Just because you can be saved doesn't mean you will be saved. I believe everyone has the opportunity. It's universally offered. The Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So he wants everybody to be saved. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. So it's, it's the world, it's all. But we have to accept it. Uh, maybe let me just use this illustration as we turn back to Luke chapter 18. I appreciate those that made the coffee this morning as we came in. It's chilly this morning. Come into a warm building. Praise the Lord for that. Uh, we've got the, the new high-tech thermostat, so it's all programmed, and it's, it's Wi-Fi compatible, so uh, it's nice and warm. We come in. We don't have to mess with it. And it came as a warm building, and uh, Mike had the coffee on this morning, so it felt good. It smelled good. And as you think about the coffee in the back, and you think about how it is it is offered to any person that comes in our church. You can, you can get coffee if you want coffee, and we've got different kinds back there. But just because it's offered doesn't mean it's accepted. You have to make the choice to accept what's being given. And salvation is the same. God's offering it for all people, but not every person will see the need to receive the free gift that's being given. So back to Luke chapter 18. Again, there's a lot of verses and maybe sometime I'll do that, just go through all those verses. Uh, but I want us to look here at this question again. And what I'm going to do with this morning sermon is look at this passage and answer the question from the passage, who then can be saved? And I want to show you four groups of people in this passage that have the opportunity to be saved. And I think we'll see that all mankind fits into one of these groups of people here but let's take a moment again and pray. If you'd pray for me, I sure appreciate that in this time. Heavenly Father, thank you that we have your word this morning. I pray that it would come to life and speak to our hearts. Lord, speak through me. Use my mind. I pray you'd clarify my thoughts. I pray, Lord, that you'd call my heart. I pray that you'd use my lips. May I be your messenger, your mouthpiece. Uh, Lord, it's a sobering and humbling responsibility to open up Scripture and preach the Word of God. And I thank you that you're standing here with me. I pray that you'd help me. I pray you'd help each listener, those that are here and those that are listening at home. Uh, God, I ask that you would help us to be focused. And Lord, may we see clearly the answer to this question from these passages. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Who then can be saved? Now let's look back to verse 9 down to verse 14. I want to show you the first group of people that can be saved. All right, verse 9, it says this, He spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Number one, who then can be saved? And this very simple outline here, I just want you to put it down this way, bad people can be saved. Bad people can be saved. I want us to focus in on this publican here. We're going to talk about another publican, Lord willing, here in the morning service in chapter 19. We'll look at Zacchaeus. But the Bible says here there's two men, 
And they both went to the same place. They went to the temple. They both did the same thing. They prayed. But the Bible says that only one individual had his prayer answered and heard. The first man was this Pharisee. He was the righteous one. At least that's what he thought and others thought. But God didn't think that. And he began to pray. And the Bible says the problem this man was he was trusting in himself. He wasn't trusting in God. He was trusting in his righteousness, not the righteousness of Christ. And he began to pray. And he began to talk about all the things that he had done and things he hadn't done. He began to compare himself with this publican. And the Bible says it's never wise for us to compare ourselves among ourselves. And after he finished praying and going through all of his qualifications and all the things he had been doing and things he'd been staying away from, then the publican began to pray. And the publican here was one of the most hated individuals in the society at the time. He was the tax collector. And I suppose today that we don't necessarily enjoy tax collectors either. That's not one of our favorite people uh, to experience. We don't like paying our taxes any more than they did in these days. But the publican here was very deceitful and dishonest. As we'll see from Zacchaeus' life here early on, uh, he was a man that was very dishonest, and he would pocket some of the taxes himself. And this publican here, he began to pray. In verse 13, it says he was standing afar off, and it says that he would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now look at the conclusion of this in verse 14. It says, I tell you, this man, that's the publican, went down to his house justified. The word justified there is a powerful word. It's a judicial declaration of innocence. And here, God says he was justified. I've heard people define it this way, just as if I never sinned or just as if I never even was a sinner. That's the way God saw this man because he was humble. And before anybody can be saved, they have to be humbled. And he was humbled and realized that he needed a savior and he needed mercy. And God saved this man. The Bible says he was justified. Have you been justified? Not by yourself, not by others, but by God. Have you been declared innocent through the blood of Jesus Christ? So who can be saved? Well, publicans can be saved. This was the, the worst type of individual in this society. He was deceitful. He was hated, dishonest, corrupt, uh, whatever you can imagine this man was. But he realized that he needed to be saved, and he was. I think it's interesting the emphasis here this morning on that song, Amazing Grace. I appreciate singing it and hearing it played this morning. And uh, I thought about reading, but I won't for time's sake. Uh, I have a book that's just entitled, Then Sings My Soul. And uh, this book has 150 of the world's greatest hymn stories. And uh, one of the reasons why I love the hymns in our hymnal is the stories behind them. They're powerful in their message, but uh, what encouraged and inspired these people to write these words is it's powerful. And John Newton was the, the man that wrote Amazing Grace. His mother died when he was seven years old. Before she died, she taught him the Bible stories, and he would pray, and he'd learn these stories. And uh, after she passed away, he went through a, a very turbulent time. He was in uh, boarding school some, and then he, he set out on the high seas, and he was just very, a very wicked man. But one night as he was on a ship, a great storm came up. And God used that storm to get John Newton's attention. And he cried out to God for salvation. And he said that that day, God not, not only saved him from the storm, but saved him from his sins. His life was changed. He went on to be a preacher of the gospel. But he, he tells his story in that song, Amazing Grace, that God would save a wretch like me. So who then can be saved? God saves bad people. You think about the Apostle Paul and others in Scripture. Their life was radically changed through the power of the gospel. So as we think about the groups of people in this passage, we see first off that God saves bad people. Sometimes you'll meet people and you'll invite them into God's house. And sometimes they'll say things like, well, if I walked into the church building, the, you know, the, the roof would cave in on me because of my past and what I've done. But God specializes in saving wicked people. Now, notice the second group here, verse 15 through 17. Who then can be saved? Bad people. Now, look at verse 15. It says, They brought unto him also infants, that he would touch them. 
But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. So bad people can be saved. And then I just put it down this way, little people can be saved. He talks about the infants, but then he talks about children in verse 16. So these mothers, and this was not uncommon in those days for moms to bring their children into the rabbis and the teachers and have them bless their children. Uh, We do something similar here. We don't do infant baptism because we believe in scriptural baptism, believer's baptism, and babies don't know they're sinners. They don't really know who Jesus is yet. They're, They're not understanding that they need a savior, so we don't baptize babies, but we often will dedicate children to the Lord and we'll dedicate parents to the Lord. And so this was a common thing to bring the children to the teachers and the rabbis. But Jesus says something important here to his disciples. He rebukes them because Jesus loves children. And if we're too busy for kids, then we're really too busy because kids are the future, the future generations. We need to invest in them. And Jesus said, suffer them uh, to come unto me, the little children, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. What was he saying in verse 17? Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall no wise enter therein. The faith of a little child, just simple childlike faith. He's not telling us to be childish, but childlike in our faith. That kids just believe in Jesus. They believe in God. As we get older, we become much more skeptical. Have you noticed that? Uh, During the last several months, I have become much more skeptical. Who, Who should I believe? Who should I not believe? It's very challenging. We become more skeptical as we grow older. But kids here, they just believe. Now, we have to be careful of that, that we're teaching them the right things during those Uh, formative years, impressionable years, but they just believe. If somebody tells them, hey, you're a sinner and and sin must be paid for and death and hell is the penalty for sin, they just believe that. And we tell them that Jesus died for their sins and whosoever will can be saved. They just believe that. Often, children that grow up in church get saved at a young age. Uh, We were praying uh, with a family recently as they brought their child to be dedicated, and we're praying for the child, and and my prayer was this, that God would save this child at a young age. I think that's a great prayer, because then you can avoid a lot of the scars and the baggage and the shame of living years and years without Christ. And often children will be saved at a young age if they grow up in a Christian home and they're in a good, solid church. And Jesus here says, that children can be saved. I'm thankful that our family is all saved. I remember when our kids got saved. I remember how grateful I was and thankful. When somebody does something nice for you, it's a blessing. When somebody does something nice for your kids, it means even even more. And the night that God saved my kids, I was so grateful and thankful to him for doing that. I was thinking about a, a young child that was saved, and I've probably told you his story before, but Robert Moffat, was a great missionary to Africa, southern Africa, for many years. He was there 52 years. And uh, he was just a young man going to church, and he wasn't saved yet. And uh, he got saved in a Scottish church, and nobody else had been saved the entire year. As a matter of fact, the deacons uh, were starting to question the pastor, and, and uh, they were at a point where they're about to ask the pastor to resign because the church was not going forward, it was going backward. And the pastor said to the the deacons, he said, I understand it's been a lean year, but he said, don't forget about Bobby. He called him Wee Bobby, Robert Moffat. And Robert Moffat went on to be such a great Christian and a great missionary. Uh, His his life and ministry inspired so many others to go to the mission field. But he was saved just as a young man. And so children can be saved. When these disciples said, who then can be saved? Jesus here, within the context of this passage, is telling us, first off, sinful bad people, and that's all of us, can be saved. But little people, young people, children can be saved. Uh, We started ministry years ago uh, that we just called our Bible Club Ministry. Unfortunately, we've not been able to restart that as of yet. But through that ministry, many, many children have come to know the Lord as their personal Savior just presenting those simple truths to them. So I'm thankful that 
children can be saved. Now, notice the third group here. Verse 18 uh, let's start our reading here. We'll read about this young ruler, this rich young ruler, and his story. Now, unfortunately, he'll not be saved, but I believe he had the opportunity to be saved here. Verse 18 says, And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And let me just pause for a moment and, and show you here. This was this man's fatal flaw, is he thought that you had to do something in order to be saved. We've all met people like that. I was that way before I got saved. I thought that you could do something to be saved. You could do something to merit salvation. And that's what most people believe, that salvation is a result of behavior and not belief. But he says, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? None is good save one that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery. Do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, all these have I kept from my youth up. And when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, yet lackest thou one thing. Sell all that thou hast and distribute unto the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. And when he heard this, he, went, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it's easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And then the question in verse 26, and they that heard it said, who then can be saved? Now, whether this is referring to an actual needle or whether this is referring to a gate there in the city, we're not exactly sure. But in either case, it was a very difficult thing for a camel to go through this small gate or for an actual camel to go through the eye of a needle, these disciples were really just amazed and said, who then can be saved? Notice verse 27, Jesus said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. So it's difficult for a rich person to be saved. And we minister in a very affluent area, very religious area as well. And it's challenging for rich people to see their need of salvation. But it's not impossible. I believe that this rich man could have been saved. There are many rich believers in Scripture. Joseph of Arimathea, Abraham of the Old Testament, David, Solomon, so many others. They were very wealthy individuals, but they had a salvation experience, and they were true Christians. So this young man could have been saved, but he turned away from God because of his riches. So I believe that rich people can be saved. That's the third group, rich people. Uh, there's a story about another missionary. His name was William Borden. And I've shared his story before as well. But he illustrates the, the rich crowd. He, he grew up in, in wealth and prosperity. His parents were very successful. Uh, he was sent on a world tour when he graduated from high school at age 16. And he went to all these different places in the world. That was his graduation gift. And while on that trip, God began to burden his heart for missions. And when he came home, he, he, he expressed his calling. He said, God's calling me to be a missionary. He began to prepare for that and really gave away all of his wealth, his inheritance, so he could be a missionary for God. Now, unfortunately, he died at a very young age. As he was preparing to go to China and minister to Muslims, he first went to Egypt and was trying to learn the language. And uh, while he was there, he contracted spinal meningitis and he died. But his, his testimony went on. And, and what, a, what a blessing for him at a young age. He was saved in Chicago, a rich young man. But God saved and changed his life. So God can save wealthy people. This is the third group. Now notice the last group here. And I'll read down to this. Uh, as we come to this last encounter here with Jesus in chapter 18. So bad people can be saved. Who then can be saved? Bad people, little people, rich people. And notice here, let's start, let's pick it up where we left off, verse 28. Then Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. And he said to them, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come, life everlasting. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, 
and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spitted upon. And they shall scourge him and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. And they understood none of these things, and this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. Now notice verse 35, it says, It came to pass that as he was come nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. And hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passed by. And he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they which went before rebuked him, that he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, Receive thy sight. Thy faith hath, hath saved thee. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise unto God. Here's the last group. Not only wealthy people, but poor people can be saved. The Bible says this man, he was blind, and because of his blindness, he had to beg. What a contrast to this rich ruler in the previous verses. He's there in Jericho, and he's, he's begging for money. Jesus passes by. He cries out for mercy, and Jesus stops and sees this man. And Jesus does a miracle, not just on his body, but his soul. And the Bible says because of his faith, he was saved. That Jesus loves all people. Jesus died for all people. All men can be saved. Whosoever will can be saved. And here's a beggar that's saved by God's grace. Let me share this final illustration here. My mom grew up in a large family, and they didn't have a lot of money. And uh, one specific day, there was a man from a Baptist church in town that stopped by and knocked on her door and invited them to come to church and ride the church bus. And so that Sunday, my mom went with some of her siblings, and they began to go faithfully to this church and heard the gospel. And my mom was saved at the Baptist church there, and her life was forever changed. And God began to work in her heart, and she began to grow and mature. And I think back to how some individuals from that church went into a poor section, knocked on some doors, and invited kids to come to church, and how God saved her. And God is still a God that saves poor people. And we need to have a heart for the poor. As you study the Old Testament, I've been reminded of this as I've been studying myself, that God says, watch out for certain groups of people and, and care for them and love them. He talks about the widows, he talks about the Levites, and he talks about the poor. God has a big heart for the poor, and we should too. And Jesus here is going to save this man. He's in the final group. So as we think about mankind as a whole, I think all people could fit into one of these groups. Whether it be the bad people, whether it be the little people, whether it be the wealthy people or the poor people, Jesus says, look, I've come to seek and to save all people. And so we're thankful that we have a salvation that is universally offered, but must be individually accepted. Romans 10, 13 says this, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's bow our heads in prayer. And let me ask you a couple questions as we finish out our time together. One, have you been truly saved? Are you saved? If you're watching, if you're here this morning, are you truly saved? Have you been rescued? Have you been delivered? Do you know for sure that you're on your way to heaven? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? That's the idea of the word saved. The question was, who then can be saved? We believe everybody can be saved. But just because you can doesn't mean you will. You have to make a choice. When we got engaged years ago, I asked Sheila to marry me. I chose her, but she had to choose me. And I believe it's the same with God. God has chosen you. Let's not get hung up on the word chosen, the word elect. Uh, let, let's not pull that out of the biblical context of all of these verses that describe a whosoever will type salvation. God's chosen you. I believe he's chosen all mankind. He wants everybody to be saved. 
but we have to choose him. That doesn't mean we have a part in our salvation. That doesn't mean we have to earn our salvation through the choice. But God's given you a free will. We believe in the sovereignty of God. God knows everything. God knows who will be saved and who won't be saved. But that doesn't change the fact that it's unlimited atonement. He tasted death for every man. I'm thankful for that. If you're a bad person, and we all are, we're all sinners. If you're a young person, I'm thankful these children can be saved. One of the greatest experiences we get to have as the pastor and his family is we'll have different families call us or FaceTime us after their children get saved. That's a special thing. We enjoy being a part of that. Young people can be saved. Wealthy people can be saved, provided they're not trusting in their riches, but trusting in Christ. And poor people can be saved. Are you saved? And then secondly, are we doing our part to share the gospel with others? You can't witness to the wrong person. I really believe that. We're going to carry this thought into the next service and talk about Zacchaeus. And we're going to look at Jesus and his perfect example. And it's going to be a great challenge for us to really develop and cultivate a heart for the lost. Let's stand together, please, as we close this service. As the song's being played there, God's touched your heart this morning. I'll invite you to come and pray. If you need to be saved, would you just pray a simple prayer? Prayer like this. This was the prayer I prayed when I was a 17-year-old boy, when I trusted Christ. I just said something like this, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve death and hell. I know what the Bible says. But I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. Please forgive me of my sins. Please save me. And I remember the feeling of my sin being forgiven and lifted. It's a great thing. Never gotten over that. Maybe God's put on your heart to reach out and be a faithful witness. Take a few moments to pray here this morning as we close. in our area, Lord, may you open the hearts of wealthy religious people, help them to see their need. Lord, we know that salvation is a result of humility and belief. And the reason why the, the rich man wasn't saved is because he didn't humble himself. The reason why the publican was saved is because he recognized his need and he cried out for mercy. Lord, we thank you uh, that you're still saving the lost. I pray that you would Bless our time here in the house of God as we fellowship in between the services and touch the service to come. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.